alaykum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf wa rasirin. Sayyidi wa habibina Muhammadin sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Fa inna khayru hadith min kitabillah. Wa khayru hadhi hadhi Muhammadin sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Wa sharra al-umwari muhtathatuha wa kulla muhtathatin bid'a. وكل بضة دلار وكل الدلارة في النار أما بعض السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Take it off. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, that's good. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, we bear witness that nothing should be worshipped except Allah. And we bear witness that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam is Allah's prophet and the seal of all messengers. And we testify once again that whom Allah guides out of his infinite mercy, wisdom, love, and compassion, nothing and no one can misguide them. And we accept the reality that who Allah allows to go astray, that there's no one can guide them to the path of truth as we have come to know the path of Islam. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, it's so important to support any Islamic endeavor that involves our children and young people. And I just want to emphasize that perhaps throughout the lecture, that there is absolutely no greater investment you'll make in this country and throughout the world than to invest in creating strong, committed young Muslim brothers and sisters who are committed not only to service, but to leading the Muslim community down the path that we're destined to follow if we choose to walk in the foots of the beloved prophet, peace be upon him. But one topic that deeply fascinates me is the whole topic of identity and the crisis that is surrounding not only the Muslim community, but the whole world. And what I want you to do, brothers and sisters, is I want you to think with me for a moment on who you think you are. Notice what I said. Who do you think you are? Because most of us, we don't really know who we are. Society has spent so much time since the day that you were born, everything around you has been shaping you to be what they want you to be. And I'll give you an example. I met an American soldier in the airport, and it was a fascinating conversation I was having with her, and I asked her a simple question. I said, the thoughts that you think, the thoughts that you think, think. Are they your thoughts or are you rethinking the thoughts of someone else? Because you know once you become a person in uniform, whether it's a uniform that's manifested or a reflection of a military apparatus or military structure or you become a certain kind of professional, some people become the clothing in their mind that they put on. I want you to think for a moment. The thoughts that you think, are they your thoughts? Are they original thoughts? Have you examined those thoughts? Or are your thoughts a byproduct of deep indoctrination? For example, from the day we are born, our mothers, our fathers, our culture, our schools, and our governments control our thinking to a certain extent, and they teach us certain things that we accept. From the day you're born, as soon as you're born, people teach you certain things. And as you become older, you get a chance to influence your own thinking. But it takes a while before you make a conscious decision to decide for yourself who you are. For example, institutions that influence us, influence us. Number one, schools. As a kid, when you go to school, somebody's teaching you, putting ideas in your head. I learned as a kid about a wonderful, fictitious character. His name was Santa Claus. And I believed in Santa. He was a white guy with a white beard in a red suit that was pretty fat that came down the chimney and still remained white. No, I want you to think. And then in so many communities in America, we don't have a chimney, so how he gets in, I don't know. But there ain't no chimney on the building. But then it even got better. He was a great guy, Santa. He filled up your stockings with toys, and he had a wonderful reindeer named Rudolph whose nose lit up at night and they flew across the skies and they made stops across the galaxy 
and I believe that. And as a child, I believed in the fairy godmother, that every time you lose a tooth, you could take it and wrap it up in toilet paper, you put it underneath your pillow, and you go to sleep, and you wake up with money. My mother taught me that. She influenced my thinking. That's what she taught me. That's what I was made to believe. So today I want you to think. In terms of your identity, what shapes your thinking about who you are? Advertisement. If I go to any home in the Muslim community, you have something in your home that's name brand. How many of you have ever heard of Nike? Raise your hand. Nike. Apple. Dell. Hewitt Packard. Tropicana. Pepsi. Coca-Cola. George Bush. There you go. Name brands. Ladies who like to shop. How many of you ever heard of Chanel? I didn't even say anything yet. I said ladies who like to shop, they did like that. Ladies, how many of you ever heard of Chanel? Raise your hand. Come on, ladies. Come on. Don't go like this. Go. Brothers, check the credit card when you go home. Especially the ones you can't find no more. Now listen. Name brands are big. Name branding is big. Some of us, we go to Hajj, a sacred journey. We got two passports. One from the home country. And some of us, we've been privileged to get the American passport. We're nationalized citizens. You go to Mecca, you got to make a choice which passport you want to pull out. You want to pull out the passport from your country of birth, or you want to pull out the American passport. And something says, pull out that American passport. And you pull it out, they say, any Americans here? America, America, wallahi, America, ta'al, yalla, yalla, come, America. No, it's true. If you have an American passport, people have come from Pakistan, India, Nigeria. They've come from Sudan. They're waiting in the airport for hours. America playing lands. Any airline coming from the U.S., if you land and there was 3,000 people online, when the plane lands and it says, America, marhaba bikum ahlan wa sahlan sahibna America, yalla ta'al. That's it. It's true. Identity is real. This stuff is real. Muslim sometime in America. Identity. Say, what are you? Are you Muslim, American, American, Muslim? What kind of question is that? You don't know who you are? Do you know you was Muslim before there was a country ever called America? America is a baby on the world's map. China got 5,000 years of civilization. And in the library or the museum library in New York, they have on the wall that Africa's civilization dates back more than 4 million years. And now, I mean, a lot of people say, you know what, we're just all from Africa, and that's scary. You start talking like that, they start cutting mics off and sound defects. <laughs> it's okay, I'll scream to the back. Don't get scared, Muslims, I got this one. This is on me. They're not going to bother y'all. But I want you to think. I need you to think. I want you to think, people. People say, oh, we are Africans now. It scares me. Because now, to me, that means everybody's trying to go back now. They're going to go back up in there again with a new col colonial mindset. No, 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 wait. Y'all stay on that side. Let African people develop their land. They got the gold, the diamond, the uranium. You know, when I grew up in America, the last thing you would say is you was an African. Any Egyptians here? Al-Ikhwam in Bilad al-Arabiya wa al-Ikhwam in Masr. Masr, raise your hand. Egypt. I love Egypt. But you ask an Egyptian, where are you from? Egypt. I say, okay, where are you from? Egypt. Where are you from? Egypt. He will not say Africa. Except when he's applying now for a scholarship and they have privileges for African Americans. He says, brother, I'm an African American. <laughs> I'm serious. I ask a Muslim that's darker than me, brother, what color you are? I'm white. Brother, I'm not white. What color are you? White. No, Muslims, can I be honest with you about identity crisis? A brother comes to me, he want a wife. Brother Abdul Malik, yes, I need to find a wife. Identity crisis. Yes, brother, find me one good American. One good American girl, inshallah. Okay. But brother, one thing. 
She should be white. Okay, brother? No offense. Why? No, some of the magazines, I see the Muslim magazines, they have something really crazy in the back. They write, I'm looking for a wife, blonde eyes, blue hair. What you looking for? No, some of us as men, we have turned even our backs on our own women because there's an identity crisis. We're not sure what color we want our children to be because the world got us thinking in color, in race, in nationality, and in gender, and that is the sickness and the greatest weapon of Satan because if we focus on what we are not, then we can never become who we're supposed to be. You gotta know who you are. You must know who you are, Muslims. Now, when you look at Fox News, you get scared of yourself because everything that's Islamic and that associate with our identity is, is bad. I ask a brother now, are you Muslim? Well, brother, you know, um, I believe in universal religion and world peace. What kind of nonsense is this? Really? You go to a program and the Muslims, mashallah, they're in love with interfaith dialogue, mashallah. They won't even say Allah. They'll say we want to thank God for all of his blessings and uh, we believe in the world. Okay, brother, say Allah's name. Say, no, brother, we don't want to offend the people. What's wrong with you? I go to Islamic conventions, sometimes I'm amazed. We bring people to tell our children that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. You want to take Muslim kids to a big convention for someone to tell them that? Because they are a big preacher in America and sometimes we feel honored by their presence. We bring a non-Muslim celebrity, mashallah. A basketball player come here right now, these kids will go crazy. Oh my God, oh my God, come on, they start running, why? Wallahi, Mike Tyson came to the masjid one time and the Muslims lost their mind. Mike Tyson couldn't find his sneakers because they were just going crazy. Identity crisis, he's a boxer. But you know what happened? Television built them up. TV can build you up or tear you down. So I want you to think, Muslims, I don't have a lot of time, but when it comes to identity, who are we? When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Sister, when you look in the mirror and you put a hijab on, how do you feel? Do you feel beautiful? Or do you go, Got to go out here and deal with these people again and put this thing on my head. And, you know, I know the religion is all required, but, you know, I don't know what's the big deal about hair, but I got to cover up. No, ladies, wait a minute. I want you to think. Some people tell you if you didn't have your scarf on, you could find a job. So how come all the women in America without scarves are unemployed? Now look at the psychology when it comes to identity. They make you feel bad for covering your head. But women in America are wearing wigs and extensions all in their head. It's a billion dollar business. They got hair in their head from the gates of India, never met the people in wearing their hair. Come on, I'll just be honest with you. I won't pick on any foreigners, I'll pick on myself. I see beautiful African American women sometimes. They got blonde hair and blue eyes. And they're at the bus stop doing this. And they're like, you see my hair? No, sister, it's not your hair. It's a wig. It's not yours. Now, you may have paid for it, but it's not your hair. They confuse us with identity. I've met Muslims in your face. I know you are Arab, your face, your features. You were born of the Arab people, but now you speak French. And when you speak French, you feel so intelligent. I sit with Muslims to eat dinner, mashallah, and I go to break the bread with my hand and do some rice, and I love the biryani from Pakistan, and mashallah, the curry goat is delicious, and the chicken mekni, mashallah. I'm eating, and they go, Brother Abdul Malik. I say, yes, brother, please, here, the fork, the spoon, take it. And I watch the Muslims, mashallah. They take the napkin. And they got the fork. Yes, brother, what kind of nonsense is this? And some of us, we feel so intelligent. I had a friend I grew up with, identity crisis. His name is Muhammad. He's my friend. So I said, Brother Muhammad, how are you doing? He said, Brother, you have to call me Dr. Muhammad. I said, I'm not going to call you Dr. Muhammad. He said, then I won't answer you. I said, then I won't call you. <laughs> because in his mind, now he has status. See, when they create identity, they base it upon the illusion of a certain level of success and a certain level of superiority. Because that's what humans do. Your nationality gives you a certain status. Your race gives you a certain status. Your financial position gives you a certain status amongst people. But with Allah, the only benefit you get is for your righteousness. 
Who are you? Who are you? When you were born, who are you? Because each and every one of us, we're born with a unique identity. When Allah made you, he never made another like you. You are unique. There's only one of you on this planet. And there will be no one ever to be you. And you can never be anyone but yourself. You can't be anybody else. You can try. But you'll never succeed. And those who get us to emulate and emutate them, they make fun of us. Because they know you could never beat them. You could try to be like them, but it just shows your mind has been conquered. Because anytime you want to be someone else and you don't want to be yourself, that means you are being controlled psychologically by a force outside of yourself because you don't love yourself enough to embrace who you are. You got to love yourself. And you have to know who you are. So there are different components to the human being. There's your physical DNA. There's your cultural identity that is a byproduct of your family. There's your ethnic identity that's a byproduct of your society. Then there's your spiritual DNA that's universal. That each and every one have a spiritual DNA which is the true essence of your identity because brothers and sisters, when you and I die, and we will, this flesh will become the food of the maggots. We are the food of another creature, and they're waiting for us patiently. Then who are you? If you couldn't look in the mirror, who are you? If you couldn't hear, who are you? I asked the man in the airport if I was blind, and you were blind, and you couldn't see me, what color would I be? He said, I don't know. I said, that's my whole point. Color is insignificant. I was making fajr one day in the masjid, blew my mind. And a Muslim scholar, he was a blind man. He was making fajr, we finished fajr, and after prayer, he said to the brother, he said, so brother, did you get married? He said, yes. He said, what color is your wife? I said, damn, even a blind Muslim scholar's into race. <laughs> what would a blind man know about color? He asked the brother, is she a white or black American? He said, she's white, mashallah. What's wrong with us? I was talking to a white Muslim brother, and some of my friends are here from the Muslim community from Panama City. They're Americans, white Americans. They tell me when they become Muslim, it's like a, it's a parade. People get excited. <laughs> He's white, he became Muslim. He's one of us now. Why are you so excited? Why are you get excited? Because brothers and sisters, in reality, white supremacy is still ruling the world. People are still concerned with color. Do you know the Prophet Muhammad had to warn people about color? When he talked about the story or, or the story of Bilal, you know how dangerous that is? Do you know that Shaitan's number one fall, his number one fall is because of his arrogance and his ideology that he was better. When Allah was creating Adam, he created him from the dust. And when Allah said, well, if and we ordered the angels to bow down in the presence of Adam, and they all surrendered except one. His name was Iblis. What did he say? <laughs> you have created me from fire. You made Adam from the dust or from clay, and I am better than he. That's real today in the world. When the children of Palestine are killed, identity crisis, when they drop bombs on Palestinians, you don't see nobody raise a flag. There's no flag. They're Palestinians. Yeah. On rocks. Yeah. When they kill them people in Baghdad, yeah, nobody crying. But if one American die, you got to shut down the whole country. They cry. I love the Muslims, but they're confused. At the massages now, they're raising the American flag on the building. I said, brother, why you put an American flag on the building for? Jews don't hang American flags on their building. I said, brother Abdul Malik, you're extremist, brother. We love this country, brother. I said, brother, then I want you to hang the Israeli flag next to the American flag. They said, brother, we won't do that. Why not? They're one and the same. They've told you that over and over again. I need you to think. Yes, you are Americans. 
but you are a different type of Americans. You are the Muslim America. There's black America, white America. There's Irish America, Jewish America. There's Italian America. There are all kinds of American people. And everyone that comes into America that knows the origin of their people and maintains their cultural identity, they don't melt in the pot. They clean the pot and contribute to the betterment of society, but they remember who they are. Now, I'll give you this as I conclude, because I know my time is going to be up quick. You've got to study history, brothers and sisters. And you got to study American history because you live in America. In the days of slavery, they had something called slave culture. There was a rule. In order to break the slave, the first thing you do is take away the identity. You take his identity. You take his language, his culture, his religion, and make him hate himself. Make him hate himself. Change his name from Kunta Kinte to Tobi. Instead of being a, a prince, make him call himself a nigger. Make him hate himself. So as a generation goes, they'll kill themselves, have no respect for one another, rape and rob their own women and betray the trust of their own ancestors for who, those who struggle for their liberation, they would be ashamed to see the condition of their children today that they've lost focus of who they are as a people. Yes. Slave culture, change his name. Change his identity, take his language from him. Disconnect him from his origin. That's how some of us today are in the world of Islam. We don't know who we are. We second guess the beauty of Islam. I gotta argue with a sister or a brother about something that's Islamic. Something real simple, like making salat. Like brother, why we gotta pray we in America? What does that mean? What does that mean? Or we buy into this illusion. Mashallah, here Muslims say this all the time. Brother, Islam is going to come from America. This is where it's going to be. Don't fool yourself with that nonsense. You will contribute to the growth and the rise of Islam. Yes, we will make a contribution. But what Islam requires is a state and a country and a people. You don't have that in the United States of America, so don't fool yourself. To make Islam what it should be, it needs a state, and men and women who are dedicated to this deed, we are so far away and removed from that reality. We will make a contribution, yes, but really back home is where the power lies. You got 1.5 billion Muslims around the world. You got 10 to maybe 12 million Muslims in America. That ain't enough to change the world. Not the world that we represent. So when people ask me the question, are you an American Muslim? Yes. Muslim American, yes. However you want to label it, it's fine with me. But you'll never tell me who I am. I know who I am. Because Allah teaches you in the Quran, when he created Adam, he said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I am creating in the earth a vicegerent, a ruler. I'm surprised when I see Muslims. They're so meek. They're so meek. So like submissive. Why? You should hold your head up. When you look at the people of the world, you should know that Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatan linnas, that you are amongst the best of people because you're enjoying the good and you forbid the evil. But they've labeled the whole world of Islam as a third world country, and we talk like that about ourselves. I say, brother, where are you from? Third world country. Where is the second world, brother? They skip from one to two. What makes the Western world a first class society? Tell me. They let men marry men, women marry women, is that it? That's first class to you, huh? That's first class? Congress passed a law. Because we don't know who we are, they passed a law that allows two people of the same gender to marry, but they won't pass the law that will protect the integrity of the Muslim community. People in Congress won't even come to the mosque. They won't even stand up for the rights of Muslims in America. And when things happen to us, they find a way politically to maneuver themselves and, you know, it was an accident. But let it happen to someone else. Let you be caught doing something wrong as a Muslim, and you'll get prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Muslim scholars come to the gates of this country, and they're held in the airport for 12 hours. For what? What are you holding them for 12 hours for? 12 hours in the airport. Why? The only one reason is he's a Muslim in a wheelchair. 
Where are you coming from, Shaq? India. Okay, let him in. No, wait. Wait for what? The prophet taught us something that is so beautiful, Muslims. And if we learn one day who we truly are, and you know the power that is in your hands by the grace of Allah, you'll never let anyone disrespect you, your family, or your faith. You'll never allow that. There are people who the prophet taught us. He said, verily Allah loves the strong believer. Huh? Inna Allah yuhibbu al-mu'min al-qawi. What's the hadith? Help me. There are two servants. Al-mu'min al-qawi. Khayrun inda Allah min al-mu'min al-da'if. Wa fi kulli hiba khayran. Listen to this and I'll conclude. Because this is part of our identity to be strong. He says, al-mu'min al-qawi, the strong believer, is more dearer to Allah than the weak one. But yet, in both of them is good. I'm going to ask you a question. Strong believers. When you pick up your phone, and they say Muslim scholars in the airport being detained by Homeland Security without justification, and you make one phone call and they release him in 30 seconds. Is that strength or weakness? I can't hear you. Y'all yeah, not sure. Is it strength or weakness? When a Muslim sister is pulled over on the highway and disrespected and held by law enforcement, and she got to go through all the things that she has to go through just for having a scarf on, and you make a phone call and it stops, is that strength or weakness? When you want to build a masjid in your community, and you have all the money necessary, but people protest the building of the masjid, but you can put up $100 million and start construction overnight, is that strength or weakness? When you can get accepted to America's best schools, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Duke, the best of the schools in America, and excel at the best of what they have to offer, is that strength or weakness? Brothers, when you want to get married, and you have no money, and nobody will give you their daughter, is that strength or weakness? Huh? Brothers alike. No, brothers and sisters, let's be realistic. I don't care how much Quran you memorize. Your best friend is not going to let you marry his daughter if you're poor and broke. We'll tell you, assalamu alaikum, may Allah bless you, jazakumullah khayrin, but you're not marrying his daughter. You can recite Baqarah to Ness. It ain't going to happen. So Muslims, we have to become strong people. And we have to know that the pillar of our strength is faith. It's not in the materials, it's in faith. Ibrahim said something so beautiful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what I want you to think about, because you must go and research who you are. You must know who you are and where you are. And you must know the times in which we live in. We live in one of the greatest times in human history, especially for the growth and the rise of Islam. All over the world, Muslims are coming to their senses that Islam is the only way to go. It's the only way for us. But Ibrahim taught us a beautiful lesson. Ibrahim says in the Quran, Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّي أَرْنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيَ الْمَوْتَى Identity! Ibrahim says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّي أَرْنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيَ الْمَوْتَى Abraham said, my Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. Allah said to him, أَفَلَا تُؤْمِنْ Abraham, is it that you do not believe? He said, بَلَا For certainty I believe but that my heart may find tranquility. So what did Allah tell Ibrahim to do? To show him the power of Allah and the power of his own requests and the magnificence that is in prayer. He told Ibrahim, take the bird. Take this bird. Kill it for them. Place them on the mountains. Call them. They will come to life with speed and they will return unto you. But there's one thing I want you to think about. Allah never gave him details. He says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَهِيمُ رَبِّي كَيْفَ أَرْنِي الْمَوْتَ أَرْنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيَ الْمَوْتَ My Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. Allah never told him how he did it. Guess what he did? He gave him a demonstration. Because you know what, brothers and sisters, with all due respect, you'll never understand Allah's power. Can you imagine telling a blind person what this hotel looks like? A man who's blind. Describe this building to him. In his wildest imaginations, he would never comprehend. Never! Some of us, we have not seen the power of Allah to know who we are. You got to ask Allah in these days of trial and tribulation, Allah, show me that you're with us. Show me. Because the Muslims in America, if they want to succeed, the number one thing they have to get rid of is fear. I told the Muslims, let's go to Capitol Hill and make Juma. I said, let's go make Juma on Capitol Hill. Some of them are so scared, 
Brother, we can't go there. Why you can't go there? Why? Go to Capitol Hill. Take a million Muslims next year and have a march on Washington and pray and show the American people the beauty of Islam and the peacefulness of our deen and the greatness of our men, women, and children and the beauty of our family life and manifest to them in the public, not in the four walls and the corridors of the hotel, but show the American people the beauty of this community. Show them. Give them a demonstration. But no, they have us scared. I said to a brother, assalamu alaikum. He says, hi. No, for real, in the airport, you see a brother, salam alaikum. How you doing, brother? Why you can't give me salams? Brother, I can't identify myself here. They already know who you are, brother. You went to the checkpoint. They got your name, your manifesto. They got it all. But they got us psychologically beat. People ask me when it comes to the identity of the Muslim. They said, what do you think about the Ground Zero Mosque? Don't get in trouble. Just listen to me. I said, what do you mean? It's part of our identity of built masters everywhere we go. We say, God bless America. Well, Islam is a tremendous blessing to America. It's one of the greatest blessings to this country. They have the Jeffersonian Quran in the Library of Congress. Jefferson had a Quran. I told you the other day, one of the oldest Qurans is in the Library of Congress, written by the Muslims more than 1,000 years ago. I told some of you the other day that in the Library of Congress, there's a timeline of world civilization, and the only deen or religion written in the ceiling in the Library of Congress, where the Senate and the congressional leaders sit, the only deen in the ceiling, it says Islam. And I listened to the tour guide. When he got to Islam, and he was explaining, as I said, to the American Europeans, he went to Babylon, he went to Greece, he went to ancient Egypt, he went to America. When he got to Islam, he said Islam's contribution to world history is in the following areas. Mathematics, science, physics, geometry, algebra, calculus, philosophy, medicine. I listened for the word terrorism. He never mentioned it. Because they know. We think they don't know. And the dawah that we need to give in America has to change. It's nice to give out pamphlets. But brothers, that's not the kind of dawah we need right now. You can give people pamphlets who can't read. Some of you give it to them, they throw it on the floor. We have to understand what is the psychology and the mechanism that is used in this time to influence the thinking of the people. Allah teach you in the Quran, in the time of Jesus, medicine was powerful. So Allah gave Jesus what? He gave him the ability, make the blind see, the deaf hear, resurrect the dead. How? By Allah's permission. In the time of Moses, magic was powerful. So Allah gave Moses the ability what? To conquer the magic of the magicians. He gave him a sense of identity based upon truth and a manifestation of superiority. That truth will always crush out the brains of falsehood. Prophet Muhammad, what was his identity? The Arabs had a love for Balaga. Speech, he gave him the Quran. In this time in which we live today, what creates the identity for the people? It's mass media. 30 seconds on the TV, they can make people love you or hate you. You know they can make hijab a style tomorrow where every woman in America goes and buys a scarf and start putting it on? That's the power of influencing people's minds. Some Muslim sisters, I love you, but you're confused with the hijab because you have on a tight hijab but then you got a short shirt on and you got on tight jeans. What you doing? It shows a contradiction that you're not there. You, 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 you know you should do it. You may want to do it, but you're not there. Same thing as a Muslim. I was arguing with some of the Muslim doctors. They got Merry Christmas all over their office and giving Christmas cards out in their office. What kind of nonsense is that? Like, what kind of Muslims are you telling people Merry Christmas? I see Muslims are so confused with their children that they celebrate Halloween. What's wrong with you? They got little girls running around with hijab and their face made up like a little satanic force talking about trick or treat. You lost your mind. You a Muslim doing that? You a Muslim decorating your house with Christmas lights because you're confused of what to celebrate. We are confused because we don't know. The greatest lesson you have been given is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his prophets. Abraham named us Muslim for a reason. Because the greatest thing you can become is a true servant of Allah. Yes, you can become doctors and lawyers and engineers and bankers. You can become successful, but that don't make you who you are. 
So brothers and sisters, as I conclude, we need to find out who we are and know the greatness of ourselves. You know why? Because our children, if you don't teach them the love for this deed and self-confidence, they will be giants in the bodies of midgets. You have to change the thinking. The Muslims in America are a great community. The Muslims in this country, mashallah, you have done some wonderful things for America. Wonderful. In Panama City, maybe 70% of the medical professionals are Muslims. All the pediatricians are Muslims. So every day, Muslim doctors, male and female, are looking after America's children to make sure they're strong and healthy. But that doesn't make the front newspaper in this country. Why not? Some of you are heart surgeons. Some of you are specialists in your field. You have given the best of what you have to this country. What are you going to exchange? Some of you came to America. You were the cream of the crop of your society. You came to America as a doctor. You didn't even have to go to the medical school. You got board certified, and instantly you became a success in America. Because, you know, brothers and sisters, Muslims have always been great people. And brothers and sisters, if you would recognize who you are, you could do magnificent things. But it's right here. There's a great book called The True Believer by Eric Hoffner. You have to read that book. He's a survivor of the Holocaust, the atrocity that was perpetrated against our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community. But he survived. He survived the persecution. And he talks about the danger of indoctrinating the minds of people that they become soldiers of darkness because they do not think for themselves. You got to think, Muslims. The first revelation given to the Prophet was, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Iqara. We must read. You must understand everything that is around you, and it's not enough to teach Muslim kids to memorize the Quran, and they have no clue of what they understand. I asked a group of Muslim kids, just to see if they knew who they were. I asked them where was Mecca. One told me it was in Britain, Another one told me he's in Karachi, Pakistan. I said, mashallah. No, I'm serious. I mean, you don't know where Mecca is? I got a kid that memorized Quran. He's moving and rocking, mashallah. I said, brother, what did you read? I don't know. The imam gives the khutbah, mashallah, 800 people in the audience, mashallah. He gives the khutbah, he reads from an 18th century document. I said, imam, what did you read in Arabic? He said, I don't know. How could you not know? How can we know our own greatness if we can't understand the blueprint that is the foundation of greatness. So Muslims, we are tribes and we are ethnic communities. But the greatest identity we share is a spiritual component. Think about this, and I'm done. I come from Brooklyn. I don't know anything about Pakistan and India and Bangladesh. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Bahrain, and Qatar, and Egypt, Nigeria, Sudan, and Somalia, Uganda, and Chad, South Africa. But you know what brought me to the presence of such a magnificent group of people? Islam. That's it. The beauty of Islam unites all of us as one people. And that's what we have to keep working for. Unite the Muslims as one community. As one. So may Allah bless all of you. May he forgive me for any of my own imperfections, anything I said. And inshallah, I'm going to try to make it to the conference in Missouri. So I think this is the last time I'll see you, inshallah. But may Allah bless you, and may you be protected. And brothers and sisters, please study. Study the making of minds of men, how we get the thoughts that we have. Because the basis of your thoughts become the basis of your actions. A wise woman said to me one day, she said, be careful of your thoughts because your thoughts become your ideas. Be aware of your ideas because your ideas become your actions. She said, be conscious of your actions because your actions become your character. And I warn you of your character for it is the manifestation of your destiny. You must know who you are. And you can't know that if you're not willing to study. So may Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.